Good morning, afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology's Visualization Core Laboratory. For those of you who don't know, so CALST is a science and technology university located on the shores of the Red Sea and just north of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um, if you go about 200 kilometers uh, due west, you'll be right at the uh, Sudan-Egyptian border. So joining you from a long way away today. So very excited. This is my, uh, my first DockerCon, and I am um, really excited to be presenting about a, a technique that I have found really useful in making my data science and machine learning workflows more productive. And that's what I call the Conda plus PIP and Docker for the win. So here we go. Right, so I just wanna give you a quick motivation uh, for, uh, for this talk. So uh, whenever I'm starting a new machine learning or data science project, uh, there's a number of challenges that, that, um, that you have to deal with. So the first is package management. Um, you're always gonna to wanna to use a whole suite of tools and packages for your project, and you're gonna need different versions of those, and you're gonna to need to install them. So you're gonna to need to manage your packages. Uh, the other is environment management. So you typically have multiple data science and machine learning projects going on at the same time. And you wanna make sure that the software that you're installing for your new project is isolated from the software that's installed for other projects uh, on your system. So installing new versions or, or new packages for your new project doesn't break um, projects and code that's already working for those other projects or workflows. And then the third and fourth are uh, very much related, so workflow reproducibility and workflow portability. So you want your workflows to be reproducible, both by yourself, you know, maybe six months from now, uh, but also by any uh, peers or colleagues that, that you might have. And uh, more recently, workflow portability is an issue where um, you know, we're used to developing or maybe working on our laptops or workstations, but then if we want to scale up our um, our workflows or pipelines, we often need to port those from our, maybe our development environment to either um, a public cloud or on-premise uh, remote computing cluster where we have access to more resources or maybe different kinds of resources like GPUs that we might not have in our local dev environment. Right, so there's loads of, of ways of solving one or more of these problems. Um, if you are from the uh, you know, Python, very Python focused background, you are probably familiar with some combination of PIP um, and VM, which are kind of the standard Python default solutions for package and environment management. There's also projects like PIPIM and Poetry that, that seek to kind of accomplish the same thing um, within the Python ecosystem. Um, but for data science, uh, machine learning, scientific computing, uh, use cases, you know, many users are, are using Conda and Mamba, perhaps in combination with PIP. Um, and that is, is mostly because these workflows typically depend on more than uh, just Python. So there might be uh, Python, maybe some C++, uh, if you're doing a lot of, of HPC simulation in combination with deep learning and machine learning, which is a very hot area these days, you might have some Fortran dependencies in there. Um, bioinformatics and genomics often have workflows and pipelines where they want to combine you know, deep learning and machine learning together with their, their standard tools, which are sometimes written in Perl or Java or C++. And so the ability to knit together um, software stacks that have these kind of complex dependency chains is something where Conda and Mamba kind of really excel. And, um, and that's a, a, a tool that is widely used within data science and machine learning also has a little bit of a, a shallower learning curve uh, relative to uh, containers. And then obviously we, we have uh, Docker and also containers in general. So uh, containers are a nice complement to package managers. Uh, they solve the um, environment, uh, isolation environment management problems, workflow portability, workflow reproducibility. You still need a package manager though inside your, uh, your container or to install the software inside your container image. Right, so what is the Conda plus PIP and Docker solution? So it leverages the Conda and Mamba 
you know, existing tools and solutions that are, are well known within the, the data science, machine learning, scientific computing um, ecosystem. And we're going to uh, use those tools to kind of inject a uh, Conda environment inside of a Docker image. And then once we have that, um, that Conda environment inside of our Docker image, then we can use Docker and all of the ecosystem around Docker uh, to solve the uh, workflow portability, workflow reproducibility problems. And we're gonna use Docker Compose so that we can um, kind of bring containers into our development workflow and make it easier when we need to, again, port those research workflows um, from our local dev environment across to our production computing environment. Okay, so the bulk of this, uh, the kind of the technical portion of this talk is going to walk you through the process of writing the Docker file. Um, this is the part that I had to spend the most time myself in trying to figure out all the little um, tips and tricks to, to make this work. Um, and so I'm going to show you the bits and pieces that I put together to make this happen. Um, I have a few questions that I want to pose uh, to you as the audience along the way as well. Um, so the first thing is we're going to use a standard parent image. So I like to use a, um, a recent but not necessarily bleeding edge version of Ubuntu. Um, as my base uh, parent image, um, you know, Ubuntu is just very common uh, and probably the most widely uh, used version of Linux in the data science machine learning ecosystem. Uh, so it seems like a reasonable place to start. Um, doesn't have the smallest footprint. And one of the open questions that I have is basically how can I make the resulting images smaller um, that I get uh, out of this out of this kind of workflow. In particular, I tried to get this working with Alpine, couldn't make it happen. So if you have ideas about how to shrink the overall size of the image from this process, or if you know how, if you think you know how you can get this process uh, working with Alpine, then you know please, please reach out to me and let me know. Okay, so the first kind of uh, trick is that we need to change the default shell. So when you're working with Conda, uh, so Conda supports uh, many shells, I think, um, I don't know, six or ten, six to ten shells at this point, but it doesn't support the default shell that's used uh, to run Docker commands. So we need to switch the default shell to bash. And we also, um, this is maybe a little bit of a quirk of Conda. So Conda is um, sources uh, various bash uh, profile files uh, in order to make different commands available um, from the command line. And so in order to make sure that we get consistent sourcing of these files, we want to run the uh, bash shell as a login shell. And so that's what this, this command does. It basically sets the default shell on which all commands in the Docker file will be executed to be a login bash shell. Okay, uh, the next thing that I like to do is to create a non-root user, uh, but to create a non-root user that can be configured at build time. So the, the requirement of a non-root user is that in many environments, we, we simply can't run um, Docker applications as root. We need to run them as some user. And typically, I would like that user to be um, the user on the system outside of a container. So I've kind of set it up so that I could possibly inject my own username, my own user ID, my own group ID, uh, into the container image at build time. Um, so Stack Overflow was a great help to me when I was uh, trying to figure out the best way to add a non-root user. So I'm a little bit kind of uncertain as to whether this is kind of the best practice uh, from a security perspective or just best practice in general. So any ideas about a better way to create this non-root user would be appreciated. Okay. So the next thing that we want to do is copy over the configuration files. So Conda environments have two or three configuration files, uh, and we need to copy these uh, configuration files into the container. Uh, and then we are going to use these configuration files uh, in a future step to build our Conda environment, install the software inside the container image. So the first is an environment.yaml. Uh, so this is a YAML file, which is used to describe um, the Conda channels and the Conda dependencies that um, you need to use uh, in order to create your Conda environment inside the container. So the second file uh, that I typically use is a requirements.txt file. 
So um, it will often be the case that there might be one or two packages that you need for your project that are not available via some conda channel. And when that happens, you need to install them with pip. And it's always a good idea to install pip inside your conda environments so that um, you have a, uh, a version of pip that is available to use that's not the system's version of pip. And so that's a little conda tip there. Um, and so we're going to have a requirements.txt file so we can keep our pip installable dependencies kind of separate from our conda installable dependencies. And then depending on what version of, of Jupyter that you're using, so JupyterLab, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, very popular for prototyping in the machine learning data science community. And depending on the version of, of Jupyter that you're using, you might need to have a, a third configuration file which is where you would install any Jupyter uh, notebook or lab extensions that you might need and then rebuild Jupyter Lab to make sure that the version of, of your Jupyter Lab server that's installed in your container image has all these uh, extra features that, that you might want to install. Okay. Um, and then finally, so I'm at this stage in the Docker file, I'm still the root user. And so here I'm copying everything over as the root user and then you know, changing ownership and permissions and things like that as the root user. Um, newer versions of Docker do support copying as a non-root user. Um, so in the future, I'll probably move this section a little bit later in the Docker file um, where I've already switched over to the, the non-root user. Okay, so now in fact, we are going to switch over to a non-root user because now we're going to install Minicon. So here we've got our, the section of the Docker file that um, just runs off and grabs the uh, installer script from Anaconda and then executes the installer script and installs um, the Miniconda Python distribution in the kind of standard location. So this would be installing the same way as if you were installing outside of containers in a, in a regular Linux environment. So the second stage of the install process is to um, make sure that all of the conda commands are going to work inside the container in the same way that they would work outside of the container. So I really want the, the user experience of working with the conda environment inside the container to be the same as what you would be used to if you were not using containers at all and just using conda um, on your, your laptop or your workstation. So in particular, we need to make sure that conda gets properly added to the path um, and then we need to make sure that both the, the bash profile um, has a little bit of code injected into it. And then we also need to initialize conda for the bash shell. And so that basically, those second and third commands here edit the bash profile and then the bash RC file uh, in order to properly make uh, various conda commands work as expected inside of the Docker image. Okay, uh, the next thing I like to do is instead of cluttering up the user's home directory with all of the, the application source code and, and, and other, other project related stuff, I like to create just a separate app directory inside of the, the user home directory. And then basically we're gonna mount all of the, the, the local volumes into this app directory inside the container image. It just keeps everything a bit neat and tidy. Also follows kind of the best practice that I um, I follow myself and then encourage you know other users here at Calst to follow, which is to kind of create your, um, your to encapsulate all of your project files together in a single directory, including your software stack. So we'll be installing our conda environment inside a subdirectory of this of this app directory. Okay, so now we get to the stage where we're ready to build that conda environment. Um, so we are going to uh, run kind of three commands um, with one uh, run command in the Docker file. So we're going to update conda, make sure we have the absolute most recent version of conda before we build the conda environment. Then we're actually going to create the conda environment and then we're gonna do a little bit of cleaning. So the cleaning just helps uh, delete some cruft that is not required at runtime, helps reduce the overall size of the image a little bit. Uh, and then that final part of, of the, the Docker file here is we're going to activate that conda environment. And then if necessary, we're going to run this, um, this post build file. So, 
you know, again, depending on the version of Jupyter that you are, are working with, this you might not need to do this. Um, but if you are working with older versions of Jupyter and you want to build lab extensions and things like that, and, and uh, you will need to kind of activate the environment inside of the container image and then run this post build script and then deactivate the environment again. Okay, so the, the last um, kind of tip uh, or trick that I had to, had to get working was um, we want the Conda environment to be active already when we access the container. So if you just want to have, uh, you know, fire up a container and drop into an interactive shell, I wanted it to be the case that the Conda environment would already be active, that you wouldn't need to then you know, run your Conda activate command or do anything else. So in order to get this to work, I needed to have an entry point script. And so the entry point script basically just acts as a, as a wrapper where it makes sure that before any additional commands, either the default command or any additional command run by the user is executed, the entry point script activates the Conda environment before those commands are run. So it just makes sure that your, your Conda environment is active. And uh, I didn't want to clutter up the slide with the, the details of that entry point script. So I have a template repo uh, on GitHub. Uh, there's a link here in the slides and I'll make sure to share a link in the, uh, in the chat that will take you to the GitHub repo and you can look at the, the entry point script there. Okay, so finally, um, this part I guess is optional. So I like to, uh, I like to use Jupyter uh, for all of my prototyping, both Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. And so I wanted to make sure that a Jupyter server is running as the kind of default command. And so here I've kind of put in the magical incantation, if you will, to start up the Jupyter server running um, without a browser and kind of on all the IP addresses within the container. And then we are going to, you know, we'll connect uh, to the Jupyter Lab server and, uh, from our, our browser outside of the container. Um, obviously, so you will need to have listed Jupyter Lab or, or Jupyter Notebooks as a um, dependency inside of your Conda environment file uh, in order for this to work. So if you're not using Jupyter, that's cool, but obviously you don't want to use this default command. Then. Okay, so now that we've we've kind of walked through the the details of how to build the or how to write the Docker file, building and running the image is our are just standard. So we're going to use a standard build command. So here I'm using um, you know, custom build args to inject uh, user UID and GID into the Docker file. Then we can have an image name and an image tag. Um, it, you might, if you're a really eagle-eyed uh, viewer, you might notice that the Docker build context is actually the parent directory of, of um, the directory in which this command is run. And that's because in the, the template repo, just to keep things neat and tidy, I like to have a, a Docker directory in all my projects. And then I like to keep all of my Docker related files, both the Docker file, also the Docker compose, uh, YAML file, any other kind of files that are related to the Docker uh, container process um, in that directory. And so when I run this Docker build command, I run it from within that directory such that the build context is then the parent directory. Okay. So then after we built the image, we can run a container. Again, we use the standard um, run command for containers. So um, we have a bunch of, typically we're gonna have a bunch of volumes that are gonna be on our um, outside of the container that are gonna contain things like our application source code, um, a folder where we're gonna write, write uh, intermediate results, um, notebooks, um, a directory for data, a directory for maybe some executable shell scripts or other binaries that, that we might have that are part of this project. We just have quite a few um, um, directories that we need to mount uh, into the container. And also we have a, um, a port that we're gonna need to publish because we, our uh, Jupyter server is gonna be running on a particular port. Okay. So that, build, or that run command is um, you know, quite verbose. It would be a pain to type that run command over and over and over again. So we might as well get used to using Docker Compose, um, if for no other reason than to just automate that that Docker um, that Docker run command. So um, 
this slide might be a little bit small, a little bit hard, uh, hard to see, um, but I just wanted to get kind of a rough version of what that Docker Compose file would look like and to show you how you can uh, list out the build args um, so we can actually run this Docker Compose up command with a dash dash build and this will build the image if necessary. And if there's been no changes to any of the image layers, then it will just do a standard Docker up command. Um, and, and again, this automates the, the volumes and the ports and, and all of the, the, the stuff that we would normally have to type in that Docker run command. Now, uh, one cool thing that I, I learned uh, recently was that you can have a, uh, you can inject environment variables into this YAML file. So in particular, the user UID and GID, I inject those into this file um, by just listing them out in a .emv file. Um, and then I can run the docker compose config command and this will, um, uh, this will perform those substitutions and then just return uh, in the terminal kind of what the final docker compose file would look like. And it allows you to kind of check and make sure that that configuration has worked properly before you then go and try to run your docker compose up. And then of course, when you're finished, you just run docker compose down and tear it all down. Okay, so now I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, so I covered what I call the Conda plus pip and Docker approach. So the core idea is to use tools that um, data science, machine learning, uh, you know, engineers, people in scientific computing, are already used to using outside of containers. So that's Conda and PIP. And then come up with an approach that will allow them to inject those environments into a Docker image um, without having to learn too much about um, the mechanics of writing a Docker file. So you can kind of just have a, a template Docker file and you just inject your, your Conda plus PIP environment into that. Um, there's a template repo on GitHub that has all the details. You can you know, fork it or clone it or um, create a template uh, project from it um, that will have all this kind of set up and will um, some documentation to show you how it all works. Um, and then lastly, I want to point out two projects that have heavily influenced um, my my thinking and my learning about how this uh, how this goes. So uh, the first is the uh, Jupyter repo to Docker. So Jupyter repo to Docker is a production quality tool that will take a, a Git repository and um, inject it into a Docker image. So it's much more general and much more, um, well, I mean, production ready than the solution that I have outlined here. And in particular, a lot of the areas in which I got stuck, I got myself unstuck by kind of um, you know taking inspiration and reading through some of the issues and things that they had dealt with to get their their tool working. And along the way, I learned a lot both about Docker and a lot more about um, kind of reproducible and portable workflows by just participating in this repo to Docker ecosystem. So if you're not familiar with that project, definitely check it out. Uh, the second project is the Binder Hub project, which actually leverages the Jupyter repo to Docker project and um, takes a Git repository injects it into a Docker image and then launches it on some uh, donated cloud computing resources. So it's a really fantastic way to uh, share your, uh, your research or your, uh, your prototypes in data science, machine learning, or whatever kind of uh, application domain that you're in and uh, supports Python and R and all sorts of, of other different uh, programming language environments. Um, and again, leverages this Jupyter repo to Docker tool. So can't end without having given them uh, some proper shout outs. Okay, so last slide. So uh, where do I go from here? So I would like to understand more about how we could reduce the size of the resulting image. So that wasn't something I was initially concerned about, but um, as I have kind of, now that I have a working, a working process, I would like to just for my own edification and understanding, learn how to make Docker images very small. So if I could get this working maybe with Alpine, that would be, uh, that would be really interesting. Also, um, I would like to um, improve the build process with multi-stage builds. So I don't have a lot of experience with, with multi-stage builds in Docker. 
um, but it's something that I would like to learn. And I feel like this approach matches up pretty well with the ideas with, with multi-stage build. I mean, we can divide it into the build process into, um, you know, two or three chunks, you know, each of which can kind of stand alone. And that might overall help reduce the size of the image, um, or maybe I'll just learn more about how to do multi-stage builds in Docker. Uh, and then finally, I need to incorporate GPU support. So, I mean, Docker containers um, and, you know, Docker supports GPUs. Uh, Docker Compose might support GPUs, and this is kind of the point where I'm stuck and where I would really like, like some, um, some pointers, is what is the magic incantation that I need to put in the Docker Compose YAML file to make sure that my um, containers can access GPUs that are installed outside of the container. Now, one of the cool features of Conda is that Conda will manage all of the GPU libraries for you. So it will, if you have code that, ha or if you have packages with GPU dependencies like PyTorch or TensorFlow or Rapids or something like this, Conda can get all of the CUDA, uh, the CUDA toolkit and um, Nickel and any other kind of um, uh, CUDNN, other I NVIDIA GPU libraries that you need, it can install those for you. So you don't actually have to rely on um, either one of the, you know, a very heavyweight parent image that contains all of this stuff for you installed on your system. You can actually do a, a much more lightweight parent image and then use Conda to manage all of this. But you still need some, some uh, you know, magic lines in your YAML file to, uh, to get that working with Docker Compose, and I haven't been able to figure those out yet. So that's, uh, anyone in the audience who might be able to help me with that, I would be very keen to, uh, to talk to you. And with that, I'll wrap up. So thank you very much. I've been really excited to, uh, to give this presentation at, at what is my first DockerCon, uh, hopefully first of many DockerCons, and I look forward to interacting with you in the live chat afterwards. Bye for now.